It's Friday, December 17th. My name's Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel where here today at headquarters we've got, we had eight inches of pure genuine Sierra concrete snow, almost solid concrete here on the ground with more precipitation on the way, hopefully helping to get us out of this rain deficit we have here in Northern California. On Friday, the 10th of December, a young man lost his life while flying a night freight cargo operation on the East Coast while on landing. Here's what we know so far from the Aviation Safety Network. Castle Aviation, which is a cargo and part 135 operator, flight CSJ921, a Swearingen SA226AT Merlin 4 aircraft, November 54 Gulf Papa, was destroyed when it crashed into the bank of the Merrimack River about 600 meters short of the threshold of runway 6 at Manchester Boston Regional Airport. That's MHT, New Hampshire, USA. The sole pilot on board was fatally injured. A very well-known and well-loved young pilot was lost in this crash. The weather at the time of the crash was calm winds, 10 miles visibility, broken clouds at 1,700 feet above the ground, overcast at 7,500 feet above the ground, temperature minus 02 Celsius, dew point minus 05. Icing conditions were present. The pilot shortage is here now, and now it's turned deadly. Here's some of the factors of why this has changed so quickly and so suddenly. With the COVID-19 pandemic, many of your experienced pilots re retired or resigned as the commercial flying just fell off a cliff last year here in the United States and around the world. Now we have COVID vaccine mandates which are forcing another wave of retirements out of the aviation industry. Coupled with that is an extreme need for cargo flying throughout the world, especially cargo flying related to medical operations. So cargo operators are running full tilt trying to meet this demand and the best way of course to make money in cargo is to fill up the aircraft. Coupled with all this is a presumed lack of FAA oversight. This also ties into the accident that happened with the R4D up in Merrill, Alaska. If you're a part 135 operator right now, you can barely get a hold of the FAA except via telephone. The FAA has retreated back to their cubicles, their offices, and are not willing to come out and talk to, they're not willing to get out with the public, mingle with the public, because of COVID concerns. As a result, very important things like inspections on the ground of these various operations and check rides are not being performed. Check rides by the FAA for Part 135 operators are being done by GoPro cameras. So the FAA has decided to, why don't you go ahead and film your flights solo in your aircraft with a GoPro camera, send us that video footage in one single unedited video, well, the FAA doesn't understand that when you GoPro something, it cuts the files into chunks, so you have to edit it, all the chunks together into one file, but yet they want it unedited, catch 22, and send it to them, and they will review your flight and get you your check ride, or check the square that your check ride is complete. If they don't like what they see, or if, they, if there's something wrong with the editing, you've got to completely do the ride all over again and resubmit the entire video file to the FAA. So as a result, we are seeing an increase in incidents and accidents, especially in freight operations. Let's go inside and take a look at what happened to this Merlin aircraft on final approach. The pilot reported an engine failure. Was it a single engine failure or was it a dual engine failure? We don't know. As I've mentioned many times before on this channel, there's nothing more demanding in aviation than flying single pilot at night in instrument conditions in a complex multi-engine aircraft, especially in an aircraft like this Merlin, which has a reputation of being a hot handful, especially in the event of an emergency. This aircraft was being flown from Essex County Airport in New Jersey, short flight uh, 177 nautical miles to Manchester Boston Regional Airport looks like uh, just a bit north 
of the main airport there at Boston. First, let's start with the ADSB data from flightaware.com. Remember, the general rule of thumb is 250 knots below 10,000 feet. Getting set up for a stabilized approach begins with the descent and arrival. Here on the ADSB data for this particular flight, and by the way, the icing conditions that I mentioned are based on the clouds that were reported at the time at the airport. So the icing conditions would be presumed to be in the either en route portion or descent portion of this flight. So here we are coming out of 10,000 feet and a 368 mile per hour ground speed on the ADSB data. Remember, this is ground speed and it can be inaccurate ADSB data. 250 knots translates to about 287 miles an hour, but here we are at nearly 368 miles an hour. Descending on through 10,000 feet, maintaining a very high speed. I'm not sure why he wants to maintain this fast speed coming down out of 10,000 feet. He's well over 300 miles an hour, all the way down to 3,200 feet or so just a little over 3,000 feet. And then he begins slowing the aircraft down. And right about here, somewhere between 2,000 and 1,500 feet, he should be intercepting the glide slope for the ILS approach for runway six. And he should be slowing to approach speed. He should be fully configured and slowed to his approach speed at 1,000 feet above the ground. And here he's showing about 168 miles an hour ground speed at 1,000 feet. Remember too, it's not uncommon for ATC to hold you at about 180 knots to the marker or glide slope intercept for air traffic control flow. So between the marker or glide slope intercept and 1,000 feet, you need to get slowed down and fully configured to be on a stabilized approach. And then from this point on in, the airspeed and the altitude just decay to the point where he ends up crashing short of the runway. Now let's look at the ADSB data from ADSB Exchange, which is a little more fine-tuned, and this is in knots. Here we've got at 2,500 feet, still 254 knots, 245, 236, slowing down. Here at about glide slope intercept, somewhere around in here, 1,500 feet, 1,400 feet, slowing to 186, 169, 163, slowing to a reasonable approach speed in here. But then the last couple of hundred feet, 800, 600, 500, down to 132 knots, that's, that's okay. But 400 feet, 121, and then down to 98 knots, well below his approach speed, and then ended up landing short of the runway along the banks of the Merrimack river now let's go over to our friend victor at vast aviation as he's captured the audio of the final moments of this flight and what i want you to listen to carefully is the background noise of the accident aircraft while he's talking on the radio that's our accident aircraft our fedex 1291 heavy will be ready to go to the answer He's saying he's established, I believe he's saying he's established on glide slope. At least he's established on the final approach for runway 06. 1291 Heavy Manchester Tower, fly runway heading, runway 35, clear for takeoff. Fly a runway heading, clear for takeoff, runway 35, FedEx 1291 Heavy. Castle 921, contact port, uh, Manchester Tower, 121.3. Port of Tower, Castle 921. You can hear both Top engines. Archer, good evening, FedEx 1291 Heavy, 1,700 for 3,000. FedEx 1291 Heavy, Boston, departure, radar contact, one nineteen one zero thousand. That's the FedEx aircraft that's out ahead taking off of the accident aircraft. I maintain one zero thousand FedEx 1291 Heavy. Tower, gas on I-21, ILS-6. Castle 921, Manchester Tower, runway 6, clear to land, 1 departure off of runway 3, south prior to your 6, clear to land, or roger on the traffic for Castle 921. You can hear both engines running. Castle 921, that's the failure. He's reporting engine failure in the singular tense, but listen again to the background. And those of you that operate the Merlin, can you 
pick up on any of the other um, background noises that you're hearing there? Castle 921, that's a failure. And that's the last call we get from the Castle flight. What was that in the background? The uh, the background noise there. Those of you guys that fly the Merlin, what what did that sound like to you? And did it sound like a single engine failure, or was this potentially a dual engine failure? Now let's talk a little bit about the TPE three thirty one engines and their susceptibility to ice in icing conditions, as this is something that investigators are going to be looking at very closely as this aircraft and these engines have, do have a history of issues with icing in icing conditions. The engines on this aircraft are what's known as a fixed shaft turboprop engine. This is in um, contrast to the PT-6A type design, which is a split shaft or a free turbine engine. So on these Garrett engines, the gearbox that drives the propeller is directly connected to the compressor and um, turbine section of the engine. So in the event of an engine failure, there's a lot of drag on this engine. So to help you with that is a thing called the NTS system or negative torque system. Normally when operating this engine, air comes in through the air inlet and is preheated in icing conditions to avoid chunks of ice getting into the engine. And it flows through the two centrifugal flow compressor section, then blows into the combustor section here. Here's where your igniter is located. And then that fire is blown over the three axial flow turbines. These three axial flow turbines, the energy from that is used to turn these two compressors and whatever leftover energy there is available after this entire process. The remaining energy is sent through the shaft and through the propeller gearbox and out to drive the propeller. The advantage of this system is when you need power, it's right there. When you move the power lever forward, you're really governing the propeller and getting more power of the engine by changing the pitch of the propeller and increasing somewhat the turbine temperature by adding more fuel into the turbine section here. Instant power when you need it. Drawback of this system is in the event of an engine failure. If this engine failures fails, since it is directly connected to all the rest of the compressor and turbine section, that represents a tremendous amount of drag on the engine. And in a multi-engine aircraft, that represents a lot of adverse yaw and a lot of loss of performance. So this engine is required to have something called a NTS or negative torque system. Anytime the propeller starts driving the engine instead of normally the engine driving the propeller, the negative torque system senses that and through oil pressure automatically drives the propeller into a feathered condition such that it reduces the drag of this engine on the airplane. So there's no big rush to go and feather this engine if the negative torque system is operating correctly. In order to assist you in icing conditions or conditions of heavy precipitation is the ignition system, specifically the continuous ignition as we call it in the airliners. I believe it's called ignition override in this particular system. This continuous ignition, the basic ignition system on these turbo prop or turbine engines is nothing more than the same ignition system on your barbecue. When you turn the gas onto your barbecue, you can push the little button and get the clicker to start clicking and making a little spark for you, which will ignite the flame and get it going. That's all done automatically on engine starts on these turboprops. Now in icing conditions or conditions of heavy rain, you are going to need to turn that the ignition on continuously to help prevent a flame out. So if you're on that barbecue and you're pouring water onto your fire of your barbecue, you're going to need that click, click, click of the ignition on continuously to quickly relight the engine in the event that it flames out. Now that wears, has wear and tear on the ignition system, but it requires, it's not done automatically in these aircraft like it is done automatically in so many more airliner type aircraft. It is incumbent upon the pilot to select the ignition to ignition override in icing conditions or 
conditions of heavy precipitation. In many of these installations, and I believe on this one, it does not come on automatically when you select the engine anti-ice. So what can happen to these aircraft if operated in icing conditions without the ignition and override or without using continuous ignition is the potential for a dual engine flame out, especially on final, and this has happened before. And here's a case study from all the way back in 1997. I'll see the link down below and read through this, but what I want to go through is the cockpit voice recording of this particular accident from 1997 just to give you an idea of how quick this situation can develop. In this particular accident, it was a two-man crew and even two guys could not keep up with what was going on with the aircraft during this situation. This accident fl at flight had gone from Southern California to the Grand Canyon, attempted two approaches to get into the Grand Canyon, but the weather was below minimums. They were unable to successfully complete that approach, so they diverted to their alternate Bullhead City, Arizona, where this accident takes place. Let's pick it up here from uh, 1238. Hot 1 and Hot 2, those are the area mics. Hot 1 is the captain's mic. Hot 2 is the co-pilot's mic. Uh, tower is the tower frequency. Radio 2 is the... Uh, number two radio assumably the co-pilot talking hot one okay why don't you give me flaps to half that's the captain's call F flaps to half gear down landing checks gear coming down speeds are high three down and green concur concur okay gear props sink speed levers yaw damper nose wheel steering flaps to half before landing's done to half flaps a lot of things to think about on these merlins Tower, Metro 50 Whiskey, say your position now. Radio 2, 5 Sierra Whiskey, that's our accident aircraft. We are um, about seven, seven and a half miles south. Roger, say your airspeed, 150. We're 150. 72 Echo, say airspeed. There's a second aircraft in Navajo that the tower controller is trying to weave in front of this Metro liner. So the Navajo is a much slower aircraft than the Metro liner. So they're going to jam these guys a little bit. But the captain knows this and he's, slow, he's proactive. 72 Echo, say airspeed. Uh, 145, that's the Navajo. 72 Echo, Roger, uh, report three mile final straight in, 3 4. Try to keep your airspeed up as fast as possible. We're trying to get that Metro Liner to follow you inbound. Metro Liner is a much faster airplane. Okay, I'll do it. The captain says, go to full flaps. Tower, Metro Liner. Uh, captain says, tell him we're slowing to 130. He's being proactive. Tower, 5-0 Whiskey, uh, report about a four-mile final. Uh, stay west of the extended center line until you see the Navajo. He's going to try to keep his airspeed up for you. So they're in VFR conditions. Radio 2, yeah, we're slowing to 130. Stay west, and I have the Navajo now, Sierra Whiskey. Tower, 5-0 Whiskey, you're number two to follow that Navajo. Thanks a lot, Sierra Whiskey. Hot one, why are you saying zero? Where is he? He's right there. He's just about to cross the road. There, he's crossing the road. Now you just cross the road. You see him? He's the area mic sounds similar to engines decreasing RPM. Oh. Oh, bleep. Bleep. Dual engine failure. Feather. Feather him. Feather him. Which engine? Both of them. Feather him. Uh, call for an emergency? Yeah. Uh, Bullhead City, we have uh, we have a declaring an emergency. We have dual engine failure. We must have a uh, landing must be assured. Who am I? Tower says, who am I talking to? Five Sierra Whiskey. Tower, five Sierra Whiskey, five zero Whiskey. Say your position right now. Four, four miles south of the airport. Three, three, no, we're three miles south. Tower, five Sierra Whiskey. Roger, proceed direct to the approach end of the runway three four. You're cleared to land Navajo seven two Echo. I uh, understand you're going around. Remain on the east side of the uh, runway center line. Area Mike one, come on, sweetheart, glide on in. Dude, we're not going to make it. Where should I put it? No attempts on the restart. Yeah, go go through it. Go through the quick the quick the checklist quick. Get one restarted, dude. I'm gonna have to put it down on the road. Navajo 72 Echo, uh, say, uh, are you in the right turn now? Continued heavy breathing. Yeah, I was just going to go back around down there to the southwest. Back in the cockpit. That road or the southeast? 
dude, restart, come on quick. Oh, shit, minimums, minimums. That's the computer on the aircraft. Metroliner, 5-0 Whiskey, you going to be able to make the runway, sir? Nope, we're going to take an off-site landing. That's the captain talk to the FO, the FO relays to the tower. No, we're going to take an off-site, 5 Sierra Whiskey. Where the hell is 5-0 Whiskey? Say again, we're going to do a restart. Speed lever, shit, come on, dude, come on. Power lever, quarter forward of flight, idle, EGT, RPM, sync rate, sync rate. That's the computer talking. Okay, stop and feather. Okay, let's try this left one. So they're trying one engine and then the other, trying anything to get them restarted because they know they're not going to make the runway. Sync rate. That's the computer talking. Okay, try it. Which one? No, no, you got it. Yeah, yeah, go to. Dude, some poles. Okay, man. You got it, man. You got it, man. She's going to stall. Shit, there she goes. Stall warning horn and end of recording. These guys survived. In the end, it was determined that the lack of use of continuous ignition or ignition override was the primary cause for the dual engine failure in this particular accident. Now, we don't know if this is the situation with the most recent crash in Manchester, but this illustrates just how much of a handful these aircraft are, especially single pilot at night, IFR, in an emergency situation. Thanks so much for your support of this channel, especially over on Patreon to make this content possible. See you here.